Well, they did it. And after, uh, after they realized that it was something that I was not going to allow happen, uh, they took the vote and killed the bill instead uh, on a 9 day vote. So, you know, we go back to the fact that we have the separation of powers. We have an executive branch who's saying that we're going to have to do this because of a Fredericksburg court, room, uh, court ruling, uh, Turner versus Fredericksburg where the council member was denied the right to pray, challenged it, uh, and, and the courts upheld uh, the ability of the council to set uh, previews on how people pray. Um, and you know, our First Amendment says that Congress shall make the law uh, pertaining to uh, the or prohibiting religion and uh, or establishing a religion, nor shall they make the laws prohibited. <coughs> Congress means lawmaking body. It doesn't mean executive body. <coughs> executive body cannot make a law. The legislative body makes the laws. Therefore, it's pertaining to the Article 2 of the Constitution, this legislative body that has the ability to take and make an official religion. The executive body could never establish one. They could never make one. Therefore, in my opinion, which my opinion is, is like everybody else's, I feel, there's a hundred people in that General Assembly. If you put a hundred lawyers in one place, they every one of them will have a different opinion. But uh, the executive branch didn't fall under that courtroom. But see, we, we've gone so far uh, in the Article 3 of giving courts so much power that now they're making the law of the land and we're kind of given uh, just a, a car blanche uh, ability to make laws that they're going to rule on and decide what's right, what's wrong, what, uh, what they're going to do regardless of what the people who elect us and put us in office elect us to do. So, you know, when we talk about these separation of powers, we're talking about a mindset of putting a wall between the three. The executive branch is to enforce laws in which the legislative branch makes, and the judicial branch rules on laws in which the legislative branch makes. And if there's any uh, discrepancy or any gray area in that law, and it's ruled on by the circuit court or by the Supreme Court or whatever. It's the legislative branch's body. Uh, uh, it's their job to fix it. It's it's not the, it's not the circuit court's job. To do it. So uh, or, the, or the Supreme or whatever. And one of the things that I find interesting, and, and, it, and hopefully it, it, I know I'm not a constitutional scholar, and, any, and I know just by talking to a lot of you all that you know a lot about the Constitution. And, you know, it, it says in Article 3 about the appointment of judges that they'll be appointed and be of good behavior. It never says anything about it's going to be lifetime. And there's no term limit mentioned in the Constitution, which I assume that's where they get a lifetime appointment. But, you know, what do you define as good behavior? Is good behavior making laws or... Uh, making rulings that uh, are set by presidents instead of, instead of you ruling on this law based upon what you know, you take what presidents would set years ago and say, well, evidently this is what it means. You see, the separation of church and state came in during the slave years after the freedom of, the, of slaves. When the Supreme Court started dealing with different religions, and they took a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptist, and they read this letter about a wall of separation of church and state. And, you know, Jefferson was not ever talking about the uh, church not being involved in the government. He was talking about the government, the government not being involved in the church. And so this precedence was set when this ruling came down, and for years still dealing with it today. Why appoint judges if, if we're going to have all these presidents that we, that we have had set and no one rule on? I think we have to uh, 
that we have to review as a country how we're going to uh, set these judges in place. Uh, I think we give them too much power. I think they, uh, I, I've had legislation dealing with judges on, on the state level. I have uh, submitted legislation that basically uh, says to the judges that if you commit a crime, uh, get this, if you commit a crime, class one misdemeanor, you're to come back before the General Assembly and us review what you've done to see if you can remain in that uh, position that you're in. And the Senate kills it because uh, they said we have a, a, um, a investigative group that goes out and the Supreme Court of Virginia has the authority to remove those judges from the bench and I said, name me one judge that you've taken off the bench. There's none. And they've committed crimes. And you know, it's we appoint those judges and that those responsibilities are on us. So why shouldn't we be able to review what they've done? And it's the people that they're judging. It's my constituents that have to go before them. So therefore I think I should have the authority to say whether you stay or you go. Because I serve the people. In two years they're going to decide whether or not that they want to keep me, and they'll never decide on the judge because it's, it's the legislative body that appoints them. So I think it's, it's very important that we understand that the articles of, of, of the Constitution were set for uh, in order for us to separate those powers and what those powers would be separated for. I, uh, I tell you, I, I've, uh, I've thought about leadership. And I, I've uh, been involved now for eight years as a delegate. And I watched this came, campaign very closely. And I've seen, and I, and I ran in 2006 for Congress, and I ran against a very strong incumbent. And I, I really ran as hard as I could do, as I could run basically on my own. And I, I received 32% of the vote. I, I spent $68,000. He spent 1.3 million. I got 33 percent of the vote. I was the top vote getter per dollar spent, so I thought I did pretty well. But uh, you know, I've thought about this leadership thing and what we're doing as a country and what we've got to change. And here's here's what I, I think that you and, and these are all biblical examples of the leader. And something that we've got to do, and, and something that we've got to do, listen to our heart. Uh, when we talk about it. And the first thing I'm going to, I'm going to leave the last. But the, but the thing that these nine attributes that a leader has to have that we've got to listen to is, is this. Stay positive. How many campaigns do you hear today that stays positive? Because of money that's involved in campaign process, processes, the first thing to do is go negative and plaster the other guy's name all over the uh, media as being this bad guy, and it's all political spin. I mean, there's not a whole lot to it. it, it there's enough truth that you don't have to go to jail with. Uh, so, number one, you stay positive. And number two, you remain patient. You know, patience is the virtue of, of all things. And uh, as a politician, you learn to have a thick skin because you serve people. You know, I can't be 100% of what you want. Uh, I can't be that to my wife, so I can't be that to you. Uh, so, uh, you know, you've got to have a thick skin. You've got to remember you serve people, so you've got to remain patient and, and help them understand where you are. The third thing is you inspire a vision. Proverbs uh, uh, talked that the king, uh, wise king of Solomon once said, uh, where there's no vision, the people perish. You know, you heard it all all through this last campaign. Hope, hope, hope. But where was the vision? There was no vision. There was just a big talk of hope but no vision of where a country would go. Fourth is you encourage the heart. People know when you're speaking from the heart. People know when it's political. People know when you're sincere.